And for that, I salute and applaud each and every one of you. My talk this morning is entitled Introduction to Clinical Cardiology, or more affectionately, one might say, hmm, where's the love go? Because when we think and reflect on where we are in medicine in general, and cardiology in particular in the year 2018, I believe we're at a crossroads. Why do I say that? On one extreme, we live in an era of high-tech medicine. We have CT scans, PET scans, cardiac MRI, nuclear images, echocardiograms, angiograms. Great stuff. There's only one problem. We can't afford it. We live in an era of cost containment, on the other hand, and managed care. So at no time in the history of medicine has the need been greater than today for us to recognize the growing need and importance of a well-trained clinician. So what is a clinician? A clinician is a person who can use their own senses, the sense of sight, inspection, the sense of touch, palpation, the so-called laying on of hands, and the sense of listening, auscultation, with the aid of a simple, musical, if you will, instrument called a stethoscope to make rapid, accurate, and cost-effective diagnoses each and every day, just with our own senses and skills in the hospital at the bedside, or in the office, or in the clinic, without having to be so over-dependent and over-reliant on all the new modern whistles and bells that we have today, literally at the push of a button. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not that I'm a Luddite. I put stents in people and push buttons too. But at a time when we're concerned with the rising cost of healthcare and unnecessary tests that may be a potential risk for a patient who doesn't need it, it becomes all the more important for us to recognize what we ourselves can do with our own eyes, hands, ears, and brains to make a diagnosis when we first see a patient with suspected or known heart disease. Up front, they asked me what my PowerPoint today was. I said my powerful point is the stethoscope. And the good news is if you talk to a patient and examine a patient, the masters of clinical medicine would all tell you that more than 90% of what's wrong with the patient can be determined by just the history and the physical alone. There is no other diagnostic test to date that has that sensitivity and specificity. I was very fortunate. I was trained by a master clinician teacher named Proctor Harvey. You'll get to know the name because we'll have eight hours together in the Harvey lab with the Harvey mannequin. And that's who I dedicated this book to and who wrote the foreword. Sadly, he passed. But what he preached was a very basic, down-to-earth, hands-on approach, which he termed a five-finger approach to the patient with heart disease. The five fingers are the history, the physical, the EKG, the x-ray, and appropriate laboratory. And if we make a fist of those five fingers, we have the most powerful weapon to diagnose it and treat heart disease today, the number one killer of adult men and women in the United States. Of all the five fingers, the one that's the most important, the thumb, the history. Just talking to your patient, hearing their story, it's a story of what's wrong with them. And if you can do that properly, you'll know what to look for if you perform a physical examination. And it gets back to the old adage in clinical medicine. 
You see only what you look for. You recognize only what you know. You see only what you look for. You recognize only what you know. The art of observation was taught to me my very first day in medical school. I had a professor in front, just like I'm in front with you in a graduated auditorium. And he stood up and he said, I have a sample from a patient, a urine sample, from a patient with sugar diabetes. Now before I continue, these are the best of the best in the front row. Your future generation of cardiology folks. My fellows, physician assistants, I just want to introduce everyone to everybody. But the professor stood up in front of us and held a sample. He said it was a urine sample from a patient with sugar diabetes. He says, I want to pass this sample to everyone and I want you to put your finger in it and taste how sweet it is to make the diagnosis of sugar diabetes. And we all cringed and he passed the sample and then he smiled and said, if you would observe me closely, and of course the sample was apple juice, he said, you would have noticed that I dipped my fourth finger in the sample and sampled and tasted my fifth. Okay. I've never forgotten that. The art of observation. You see only what you look for. You recognize only what you know. There's another common adage in clinical medicine. It's a tough one. Most common things are most common. I'll say it again. The most common things are most common. It's not that we won't see rare things. I promise you, you'll see them on reruns of House MD on television. But you don't want to miss the most common things. After the history and physical, the EKG, simple, cost-effective, easy to get a hold of. Is the patient with chest pain having an ST elevation MI, a STEMI, from a plaque rupture of the clot? And the cardiogram is going to show you the ST elevation, we're going to need to rush them to the cath lab for a balloon and a stent. Or if we're in a rural hospital, we'll give a clot buster, thrombolytic therapy, maybe. Did someone come in with a cryptogenic stroke or TIA? And guess what? The EKG shows something they didn't even feel, atrial fibrillation that threw off the clot. The TV commercials, up your game with Elvis. It's irrelevant. After the history physical EKG, the chest x-ray. No one looks at them anymore. They just wait for the report to come back on the MR. But you can look at it. Is the heart size large? Is there fluid? Is there congestive heart failure? Some clue to heart disease. And notice, purposely relegated to the last finger, the pinky, are the elaborate and expensive myriad of non-invasive and invasive tests. The cornucopia of tests. Test, 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 test. But we should order them selectively, wisely, cost-effectively. Remember, not every patient needs every test. Skillful use of low technology, the history, the physical, leads to intelligent, cost-effective use of high technology. Hands before scans. Now, everyone's kind of acknowledging it makes sense, right? But that's not what's being done today anymore. Is that being done today anymore, Daniel? No. Ajir? No. no. Daniel? No. Asif? No, sir. No. They're not doing the clinical art of medicine anymore, not just in cardiology and anything. Why? What happened? How did we get to this unfortunate trend? Even cardiologists aren't doing this. We've all become technocrats, not clinicians. What happened? I can think of several reasons for this unfortunate trend. The master clinician teachers of yesteryear that would idolize and worship the physical exam, the clinical approach to a patient, they passed away. They're not around anymore. Proctor Harvey is no longer with us. I'm a hologram. I'm the last remnant who still believes that there's something to be done by talking and listening to a patient. Believe me, it's a bait and switch when you get to your third year on the clinical wards. You're not gonna see this. 
Number two, our growing fascination with technology like a child with a new toy has in the minds of today's millennial eclipsed the relevance and the importance of something so mundane as just looking at someone, talking to them, and examining them. Why should I waste time with a physical exam when I can order a test and look at technology and the images? Third of all, this is reinforced by the volume-driven managed care system. Get them in, get them out. That do not give you financial incentive to time spent with a patient. It's upside down. They reward the test. <coughs> How many RVs we get for a cath with a PCI intervention? I don't want to just talk to a patient. That's only 0.13 RVUs. I want to put a stent in. It's 15. Hello? And then if we don't learn the clinical skills, we feel that we can't perform it. We're worried about being sued for malpractice. So we practice defensive medicine and order potentially unnecessary tests that are even risky to a patient and unnecessary for a patient for fear of malpractice litigation. And the final blow to the clinical art of medicine came with everyone's machine in front of you. So please close the machine, the computer screen, the iPad, whatever you call those things. That's what came in front of you. There's no more bedside rounds. There's computer rounds. The patient is now an eye patient, not a real patient. The real patient's the emoji for the eye patient. We don't perform bedside rounds. Do we perform bedside rounds? No. no, we don't perform bedside rounds. We perform bedside rounds anymore? No. We perform computer rounds, EMR rounds. That's what you're going to do. Your patient's going to be that little screen in front of you. It's a great toy. Even the iPhones, right? No one talks anymore. So that's what's happened. So how do we bring this art back? It's crunch time. Not just for cardiology, for anything in medicine. When you wrote your personal statement, is it because you wanted to look at an iPad? I don't think so. You had a reason, right? Right. So what I want to do this morning, if I can, it doesn't allow me much time, but we'll have eight more hours together with the workshop on auscultation. What I want to do is give you true life stories that kind of emphasize how the art of clinical cardiology brings to life the diagnosis and treatment and provides compassionate state-of-the-art patient care. So let me give you a little summary. True stories. The most important finger is what? The thumb. What's the most important story a patient will talk to you about? What two words are the most common symptoms in the world of heart disease? Two words. Chest pain. Uh-uh. Your patient won't, won't go through that drill with you. Sorry. They will. There's something so deep-seated about fearful about admitting to themselves they have heart disease, they will go out of their way nine times out of ten to deny the existence of the word chest pain. Want to hear a true story? It's a story about Rose. She comes in to see Dr. Chisner with her granddaughter. Here it is. Hi, Rose. How are you? I'm fine, Dr. Chisner. Nice to see you this morning. Rose, what brought you to the office today? My granddaughter. She made me come. She complained. My granddaughter, she made me come. Grandma, tell Dr. Chisner what you're experiencing when we go for a walk at night in the mall. Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. What's nothing, Rose? Oh, Dr. Chisner, I'm 78. I'm a little out of shape. If I stop and walk and stop and walk, maybe I get a little short of breath, but it goes away as soon as I rest. Anything with the shortness of breath, Rose? Not really. I want you to look up for a second. Not really. If you were looking at your EMR and your back was faced this way, or even this way, you didn't see her do this. All you said or heard was, no, not really. And you'll plug in no chest pain or no other symptom. But she just told you. She clenched her fist in front of you. She gave you a nonverbal clue the universal language of the hands, the clenched fist sign of Samuel A. Levine,
Proctor Harvey's mentor, hello, the tradition continues. The constriction, the tightening feeling of Angela, she's not articulating that. In more than three decades, I have not ever, not once, heard any patient tell me what Tinsley Harrison says in Harrison's textbook of medicine. I have never had one person say, Dr. Chisholm, I have the most impressive feeling in the retrosternal portion of my chest, radiating across my proportion, down the ulnar aspect of my left arm, accompanied by dyspnea diaphoresis and a feeling of impending doom. <laughs> That's what it says in Harrison's textbook of medicine. Find me one person who tells you that, I'll give you something. I have yet to have one person. Instead, they'll go through the drill like Rose. Not really. Dr. Chisner, by the way, I've had hiatal hernia for years. It's just acting up. If I take Tums and Rolades, it goes away. Really, Rose? How long would it last? Oh, I don't know. I don't pay attention to it. Now you pull teeth. Well, is it lasting seconds, minutes, hours? Oh, no, no, not that long, maybe. It's 15 minutes, but it's not pain. If I take Tums, it'll go away. I said, I understand, Rose. Um, question for you. Did you ever get caught without the Tums in your purse? She looks at me, she says, I guess. I said, how long might that feeling? I know it's not pain. How long would that feeling last if you didn't have the Tums? She looks at me, she says, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I said, so let me get this straight. I know it's not pain. But whatever the feeling is, it goes away in 10 or 15 minutes, whether you had the Tums or not. What makes you so sure? The Tums relieve the feeling. Then like a deer in headlights, she looks at me with momentary introspection and says, I never thought of it that way. But I'll tell you. She just told you she had a classic case of exertional angina pectoris. She didn't say the words. But if you stood there with a questionnaire, do you get chest pain? She says, no, you go on to the next review of systems. You missed it. Or worse, someone can have chest pain, but it may not be coronary disease. Let me give you a true story number two. I'm finishing putting a stent in someone. I guess that's pretty high tech. We get called to the ER. Patient with a STEMI, ST elevation MI, is the cath lab ready? Door to balloon time, less than 90 minutes. Guideline driven therapy. Are we ready? Plaque rupture, clot. So my physician assistant goes down to the ER and calls me and says, I don't think the patient's having a heart attack. I said, what? I just got called by the ER doctor. This is what she observed, the ER doctor. Your patient is in room 27. His EKG shows ST elevation. No, we've been too busy. We haven't had a chance to see him. He needs to go to the cath lab. He's on the computer. So the physician assistant walks over. Danielle will say, are you having chest pain, sir? He says, yes, but I can't lie down. It hurts so bad. I have to sit up. And every time I take a deep breath, it's hurting me. Really? That doesn't sound like that tight, constricting feeling in the chest, does it? So then she says, well, let me do something very novel. Let me take out a stethoscope and listen to the patient. So now, all of a sudden, instead of locked up, locked up, she hears. By the way, that's on the CD in the back of the book vocalizations. That is music of what? Of an inflammation of the lining around the heart called the pericardium, and that's called a pericardial friction drug of pericarditis. That's why you couldn't lie flat, had to sit up, hurts when they breathe in, classic history and physical of pericarditis. If you were in a rural hospital and they misdiagnosed this as an ST elevation MI because the STs are elevated with pericarditis but they're concave, not convex, and they got a clot buster, thrombolytic therapy, they could have hemorrhaged to death. Wow. 
didn't need to go to a cath lab, unnecessary. He just needed medicine, anti-inflammatory medicine. True story. They missed this diagnosis at UCLA on John Ritter, a famous actor years ago. Another patient, a colleague of mine, one of you, very tall, but a lot of people are very tall, because I'm not that tall. <laughs> Daniel, you're very tall. Want to stand up? So, he doesn't have what I'm talking about, but tall, played high school basketball. Not that tall. Not that tall. Wide arm span, supple jointed. What might that person have genetically? Anybody know? Marfan. Yes, yay. Marfan. So now you have to see only what you look for, you recognize only what you know, and now you have to know, oh my God, what could Marfan's patients get? They can get a dissection of their aorta. Oh my God. So now it's 4 o'clock in the morning on a Palm Sunday. I get a phone call, a frantic phone call from the ER at Broward saying, Dr. So-and-so is here with severe chest pain radiating right to the back. Hurry. So I rush in and I'm worried because I know what he looks like. And I'm worried about a dissection. They already took an EKG that was normal. Blood pressure was elevated. So what I did was I listened. And I took out a stethoscope and I listened. And initially all I heard was la -tup, and then all of a sudden the music changes. La -tup, la -tup, la -tup. A blowing diastolic murmur of aortic regurgitation suddenly. And then I said, oh my God, my worst nightmare is happening. He's having a dissection. And then I remember a cardiac pearl, Proctor Harvey taught me. And what is a cardiac pearl? A pearl is a fact or a finding that leads to or makes a diagnosis. Like a pearl that doesn't lose its luster over time, it stands the test of time. The pearl is new onset of this aortic regurgitation in a patient with chest pain to the back, listen along the right sternal border, not just the left. And if it's louder along the right, you cinch the diagnosis of the dissection. So now I'm listening along the right. Love. To the left, love. To the right, love. And now I'm getting pale. I'm saying, let's get the operating room immediately. We have to go. He could be gone in an hour or less. So they're rushing to get everybody in. As they're rushing, a little tech comes by with the EKG machine for the second EKG in our chest brain protocol 10 minutes after the first. Now the EKG <coughs> computer reads STEMI, ST elevation myocardial infarction, ST elevation in 2, 3 ABF. The nurse looks at it and says, Dr. Chisner, the patient's having an MI. You don't want to go to the OR, you need to go to the cath lab, right? I said, well, I still think we need to go to the OR. Yes, the patient's having a heart attack, but not from what you think the mechanism is. It's not a plaque rupture clot. It's the aortic dissection now tearing the right coronary artery with the aorta. We went to the OR, and that's exactly what he had. They repaired everything, and he lived for decades afterwards. Had it been misunderstood, time would have been wasted for CT scan or MRI or TEE, transesophageal echo or angiogram, and they could have died. And if you were in a rural hospital and misrecognized this and gave thrombolytic therapy, you definitely could have hemorrhaged around the pericardium and died of cardiac tamponade. So you see the sounds and the murmurs we hear, the music of the heart has meaning. It has relevance and importance. It's not there simply for traditional purposes, to honor our predecessors and say, well, we'll go through this tradition of medicine because we feel honor bound to perform the ritual. No, it has a purpose. And it brings you closer to your patient in the process of 
providing a diagnosis for you or saving a life. It is that important. Now, a lot of people ask me, how do I know what a good stethoscope is? I love watching the vlogs, because you guys talk to each other. Oh, I like the one with red tubing. I like the blue tubing. I like the gold laminated stethoscope. I like the master one that only has one head. It's lightweight and I can wear it around my neck and it doesn't hurt me. Let me kind of give you a clue if you ever care about what you're getting. Find one with a good diaphragm piece so when you press firmly against the chest, it accentuates high frequency sounds and murmurs like the murmur of aortic regurgitation, low or the friction rub. And find one with a good bell. For low frequencies, like a gallop of heart failure, a weak heart, or a rumble of mitral stenosis. Have one with good tubing cracked with air leaks, have comfortable earpieces, so when you put it in your ears, it's not going to give you such pain, it's like a neurodotomy, be comfortable. And have a method. A very good method is Dr. Harvey's inching technique. So if you're ever interested in listening to your own heart, listen at night, no one's watching you, go to the aortic area, second right into space, and just listen to lump dump, lump dump, the second sound louder than the first. Anything between love and dub is in systole during contraction. Anything after dub diastole, lump dub, lump dub, you might hear dub. Ooh, I heard a murmur. It wasn't very loud. It was dub. It was in systole. There are six grades of murmur. One very faint, you can't hear unless you really just turn off all the noise. Two is faint, but you hear it. Three is moderate. Four, you can feel it. Five, you can lift your stethoscope partially off, and six, you can see daylight. The innocent murmur, the normal flow murmur we have, and most of us love dub, grade two out of six. Everything else is normal. Reassure the person. Reassure the parent and the child. You don't have to get an echo to prove you're correct. In fact, the echo signal, the Doppler is so sensitive, it picks up small leaks of valves that are not real disease. It's called echocardiomethogenic heart disease, not real clinical disease. So then you end up misleading the patient that they have heart disease and they get worried, oh my God, I'm gonna have a valve problem. I'm gonna need surgery when I get older. And they never will. You might hear something else. Someone might be walking and gets short of breath, tightness in their chest, even dizzy, and you listen, you hear, like you're clearing your throat. Into the carotid zone. That's aortic stenosis. That person may end up needing a valve replacement or a tab, tapper through the groin. It might be something else. It might be a young person. A young person who's scared of palpitations or anxious, lumped up, lumped up, then all of a sudden, lumped up, lumped up. Lumped up. Dub, lump, there's a in between lump and dub. That's called a mid systolic click. Lump, dub of mitral valve prolapse. Lump, dub, maybe two clicks. Lump, dub, lump, dub, maybe a series of clicks like a deck of cards. Lump, dub, lump, dub, maybe a click murmur. Lump, lump, maybe a poop like a poopy cough. Maybe a honk like a goose. <laughs> I remember a story about Lisa. Could you stand up, please? You? No, the one turning around. Right over here. There's Lisa. You, you can stand up too. There's two Lisas. You too. There's two Lisas. Everybody say hello to Lisa. Okay? Doesn't Lisa look nice? Isn't she nice and healthy looking? Okay. So Lisa comes with her mom at 4.30 on a Thursday with me. Lisa has seen seven physicians before I saw her. Lisa was told by every one of the physicians that her valve, her mitral valve, was leaking so badly, severe mitral regurgitation, 
that she needs an operation. That's pretty serious, isn't it? And I'm doctor number eight. Okay. I say, Lisa, you can sit down. What brings you here? Do you have any symptoms? Oh, I do, I do. Yes, I do. Oh, okay. What symptoms do you have? I can't tell. I'm just looking at you. I get chest pain. I get short of breath. I get palpitations. She hit the trifecta. She has three major symptoms from cardiology line. So let's do a deeper dive. What kind of chest pain are you having, Lisa? And she's 26, by the way. Well, it's right here, Dr. Chisner, and if I go like this, it hurts. Does that sound like it's coming from a heart? I didn't think so either. So we're gonna put that off the table. Tell me about your shortness of breath, Lisa. Well, I just can't get over. Do you exercise? Sure. I do cardio, I do elliptical, I do stairmaster, I do pilates. Do you huff or puff? No. Does it sound like that shortness of breath is coming from bad part of the lungs? I didn't think so either. That's off the table. I'll get to the palpitations. So I decided to do something very novel. I decided to take out a stethoscope and listen to this valve that's leaking so severely. Locked up, locked up, locked up, and then here, Love, and then a pause, and then the murmur. Love, love, love. It's not all the way through, hold up systolic. It's not, <coughs> and when it's severe, not only does the blood leak all the way back, but as the valve starts to close, it rumbles back into the ventricle. That's severe. We'll listen to that with the Harvey Mannequin. Lisa didn't have that. Lisa had love. That's it. So clinically, not severe. I said, why did they say you had a severe leak? Uh-huh. Out of the purse comes the transesophageal echo that she had. A fancy echo. One where they had to bring her in, put her to sleep, put a tube down her throat into her esophagus and look right at the valve. And the Doppler color looks really loud. But the color is misunderstood. It's velocity, not volume. It's misunderstood. It looks, wow. It looks severe. And then it's read as severe mitral regurge. So every doctor afterwards said severe mitral regurge, up, valve repair. Severe mitral regurge, surgery, valve repair. Severe mitral regurge, valve repair. Severe mitral regurge, valve, valve repair. There's only one problem. She really didn't have severe mitral regurgitation. I said to her, how many people listen to you with a stethoscope? You know what her answer was? Come on, tell me. None, none. Then she backtracks. Oh. Maybe the first doctor in the ER did. But none of the other ones, they only have based their interpretation on the echo, on the image, saying severe mitral regurgitation. Do we see this all the time, Daniel? Yes? Say it louder. Every day. Every day. Misunderstood every day. Can you imagine how many people are frightened and told they need an operation that never did? That was Lisa's story. She was going through a divorce. That's why she had her symptoms. And as far as her palpitations, she had supraventricular tachycardia, I give her that, and we taught her how to break it with Valsalva maneuvers, or vagal maneuvers, or carotid massage, which reminds me of a charming story. Dr. Levine, remember the Levine sign, Dr. Harvey's mentor, was called in 1945 to the ER at Peter Ben Brigham Hospital. There was a nurse in her 20s with a heart rate of 180 to 200 and they couldn't break it. So they called him in. He was on his way to an opera on a Saturday night. And he comes in in a tuxedo, which back in the day meant a top hat, white gloves, tails, and a cane. He takes one look at the young woman, lifts up her chin, takes his fingers, does a carotid massage, and voila, she's back in normal rhythm, and he leaves the exit and goes to the opera. She brings the family to the bedside and says, you're not gonna believe what just happened. 
I had all these doctors and interns and residents and students and nurses and nobody could help me. So in desperation, I had to call in a magician <laughs> who solved my problem immediately. True story. I was walking the hallways of Broward one day, and one of the physician assistants came up to me and says, Dr. Chisner, she refers to me as the walking echo machine, can I take a look at her mother? I said, I'd be honored to look at your mom. So <coughs> mom is 70 years of age from Jamaica. She's seen 21 other doctors. She brings with her four echocardiograms and two cats. Pretty high tech. And she's in heart failure. And they can't tell her why. That's a pretty challenge, right? How am I gonna figure it out? The four echoes can't do it and two cats can't do it. It's pretty high tech. So what do I do? I shake hands with her. And why do I shake hands? It brings me close to the patient and now it gives me an opportunity to feel the pulse. Not just for the rate and rhythm. <laughs> Not for the, just for the rate and rhythm, but if it alternates strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, that's called pulses alternates. That's a clue to a weak heart, a low ejection fraction, heart failure. But she doesn't have that. Instead, she has a quick rise pulse. Flip, 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 flip. There's only four things that can give you a quick rise pulse. Now I'm going through the drill. Just seconds worth. Most common is that aortic regurgitation. So I would listen for that blowing diastolic murmur. Blow. But I know she can't have that. Four echoes won't miss it. Two cats won't miss it. We're down to three possibilities. The second one is actually the most common cause of sudden death in the athlete below the age of 30. Does anyone know what that condition might be? Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And there's a very simple way of diagnosing that. You go up to the athlete, You shake hands, you feel a quick rise pulse. Then what you want to do next is you listen. And instead of hearing aortic regurge, which you expect, you hear a systolic murmur. Now you're going to do something called a squatting maneuver. And most of us, even if we try, do it wrong. We end up doing it and falling into each other. <laughs> so what Dr. Harvey always taught me is, Mom, you are the doctor. You're gonna sit and be comfortable, and the patient's gonna do the squat, and you're gonna listen. And then if you listen, the systolic murmur with squatting gets faint and gets loud when they stand. just made the diagnosis of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Quick rise pulse, you think of aortic regurge, instead you hear a systolic murmur, you do the squatting stand, you made the diagnosis. She's not gonna have that because the echoes won't miss it, the cats won't miss it. We're down to the third possibility, which is severe mitral regurge. That would be a whole systolic murmur, the echoes are not going to miss it. The cat's not going to miss it. We're down to the fourth possibility. I said, but she's 70. The cats can miss it. The echo can miss it. Now I'm listening here, locked up, locked up, and then over the pulmonic area, I hear. A continuous machinery-like murmur. arteriosis that she was born with 70 years earlier that nobody found. And all we had to do was close it percutaneously and she's been fine ever since. Isn't that something? You want to hear the best story of my life and then we'll, we'll be done for today? I am now your age, roughly. I'm in my late 20s when I start here. I just finished with Proctor Harvey. He's taught me all this stuff. And I'm doing it with the doctors and nurses and everyone's smiling and enjoying it. And then I get hit with the following statement from one of the heart surgeons. Mike, my best friend in church's mom is 51 at another hospital up the road. 
They said she has an end-stage cardiomyopathy, a very weak heart. And they told her to get her affairs in order. She only has two or three days left to live. Can I transfer her to you here at Broward General? I would just feel more comfortable if you went over her. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's a big thing for me. I just got out of training a few months earlier. I was very honored. I said, I'm flattered that you would like me to look over her, but it's highly unlikely I'll give you any different diagnosis. She had all the tests up the road. But if you want to bring her down and transfer her for emotional support, for compassion and for care, I'll be happy to help. He says, thank you, Michael, I really appreciate it. So she gets transferred to me on a Tuesday afternoon at 2.30. I remember it like today. They wheel her in on a stretcher. She looks like a concentration camp victim with no muscle mass, wasted, but looks like a washy or poor baby with ascites, belly full of fluid, and her neck veins were all the way up, standing in tension like a rope. I said, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Her name is Rosemary. I said, I'm so sorry, Rosemary, I'm Dr. Chisler. And I'm shaking her hand, and I'm feeling her pulse. I'm also gonna feel for that strong, weak, strong, weak clue, that pulse is all demands, the clue to a weak heart. I don't feel it. I'm surprised. I said, well, maybe my fingers aren't sensitive enough. I'm just out of training. But let me listen with my stethoscope. There's gonna be some things I'll expect to hear with a weak heart. I'll expect to hear that gallop, that S3 gallop of the heart that's weak. I'll expect to hear leaky valves. She has none of it. Now I'm really taken aback. So I decide to listen just anything I can hear. And as I inch, all I hear is one extra sound after look. nothing or feel nothing except that sound in those neck veins. Think of something else. And that something else is constrictive pericarditis, where the lining around the heart is so tight that the heart can't function and fluid builds up. So the fault is not in the heart muscle, it's the pericardium. And then, oh, by the way, they may have calcium on the chest x-ray in the pericardium, and on her stretcher is the chest x-ray. So I take the chest x-ray out and look under the lights. I'm looking for calcium. And lo and behold, there's none there. So I look it up and only 25 to 30% have it. So 70% may not. I have nothing else to go on except the physical exam. And I turned to my friend, the surgeon. I said, I can't promise anything. But if we take her to surgery and she has this pericardial constriction, and if we remove the pericardium, we could help her. And now he's shot. He says, but how is she going to survive surgery, Michael? I said, I understand, but if we don't take her, she'll only have two or three days left to live. So we go to the daughters. One of the daughters was a nurse. We all agreed to try the patient as well. I went with her. We were there for 14 hours, scraping like an orange peel the matted, adherent, scarred pericardium that was encasing the heart like a straitjacket. Once we removed the pericardium, everything got better. In two weeks, she walks out of Broward completely normal, like a normal well woman. The story gets better. She comes back a year and a half later for a totally different reason, abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, malabsorption. In the time, in those days, we do a house MD workup. We biopsy her small intestine. It was positive, PAS positive macrophages, whatever that is. And we give her a diagnosis of something rare called Whipple's disease. I said, Whipple's disease? I wonder if she had this all along. So I looked it up. There was no association of constrictive pericarditis with Whipple's disease back then. There is today. Back then, we didn't know it was caused by a microorganism. It is, we know today. This was in the beginning. I called the pathologist. I said, did you save the tissue around the heart from a year and a half ago? He says, sure. I said, would you put the stain on there? I'm just curious. Let me know if it's positive or negative. He says, sure, I'll call you this afternoon. He calls me, he said, it's positive. 
So this woman, Rose Marie, had all along this rare disease, constrictive pericarditis, causing a rare complication, constrictive pericarditis, from Whipple's disease. I would tell her story for 25 years in closing on my lectures like this. I would really emphasize the importance of clinical skills, the joy of making a diagnosis with a stethoscope, but in this case, not only making a diagnosis, but saving a life when the so-called cutting-edge technology of the time didn't quite cut. After telling her story for 25 years, I get a letter in the mail on my desk, and it read something like this. Dear Dr. Chisholm, it's been 25 years since you've heard from me. In fact, it'll be 25 years this November. I will be 75 years of age. I've seen three beautiful daughters grow into three lovely women. I have four beautiful grandchildren. You were just a young boy starting your career, but with determination and perseverance, compassion and care, you and your colleagues diagnosed my problem and saved my life. She was very dramatic. She said, yes, I am the lady with the constrictive pericarditis from Whipple's disease. Thank you for my life. I cried. I called her on the phone. I said, where have you been for the past 25 years? She says, I've been just fine. I haven't had to see anybody in all this time. Soon thereafter, I get a call from the head of Nova Southeastern would I give a keynote speech to women for American, go, American Heart Association Go Red for Women, and would I present a woman with heart disease? I knew what I wanted to do with Signature Brand. I called Rosemary, I said, would you honor me? I will have my staff pick you up with your daughters as my guest. I want you to come, I'm gonna tell our story, but I don't want you to enter the room until I've told her. So we sequestered her outside, I told the story, I said, and now with us is this wonderful woman. She comes in through the back, in white slacks, and red top. She gives me a hug. She says, oh, I just love this little boy. Wasn't a little boy. And then she embarrasses me with two statements. First statement, she says, I had 21 doctors on my case. I was told I had two or three days left to live. I was transferred, and this doctor takes out a stethoscope, and I'm in front of you today. That was bad enough. Then she really embarrasses me. She looks at me and says, do you remember what you wrote on the top of your bill? I really didn't at the time. She says, you wrote, consider this bill paid in full. I was very touched. Because I look back on the meaning of why we went into medicine, the purpose of why we wanted to become a doctor, and the whys and the wherefores of why we want to take care of people. It brings you closer to your patient and creates that bond and that compassion and care so necessary for the privileged and sacred doctor-patient relationship, doesn't it? For no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. As we continue to move into the 21st century, a time when the American healthcare system is wracked by the forces of change, the one thing that has remained constant throughout all of this time is the vital importance of the doctor and patient relationship. For being a good doctor takes knowledge and skill for sure, but I think it takes something much more than that. It requires honesty, integrity, a selfless concern for humanity, a deep sensitivity and compassion for the suffering touched with a good, strong dose of optimism, humor, and wit. I have always felt, and I feel it even stronger today than ever before, it is as important to heal the mind as it is to heal the body. For when the body is ailing, the mind is ailing as well, and it needs So until we see each other again, I will leave you with the credo of the caring practitioner. Cure if you can. Alleviate if you cannot. But always
always comfort and support. <laughs>